Hi, everyone. This is Jackson Steger, and surprise, surprise, you're listening to season two of Campfire. Let's get it. This season of Campfire seeks to understand how to build new cities. Each week, we are joined by experts and or practitioners from different startup cities who will share the stories and lessons that they have learned from experimenting with radical new models of living. Cabin is building its own network city, which you can learn more about by visiting creatorcabins.com or by following us at Creator Cabins. Two weeks after having Prospera on the show, we're visiting another project that one might be able to categorize as a platform city, to use Zach Caceres' language from earlier in the season. The Catawba Digital Economic Zone is a special jurisdiction owned by the Catawba Indian Nation. Their goal is to disrupt Delaware when it comes to governance as a service. I'm joined in this episode by the CEO of the Digital Zone, Joseph McKinney, who helps to differentiate a digital economic zone from other economic zones, explains the special legal privileges extended to the Catawba, and shares the 50-year vision for regulatory frameworks in the digital space. We kept this episode on the shorter side. DM me on Twitter if you're a fan of this newer length, or if you're not a fan, or if you just want to say hi. And as always, thanks to the team producing the show for keeping the quality of the content high. Enjoy the episode. Thanks. Joseph McKinney, welcome to Campfire. It's a pleasure. Thanks for inviting me on. So a few weeks ago, we had Prospera on the show, and we've talked about some of these different economic zones that are emerging like Prospera or others in Honduras, but also ones that historically in the last half century have been huge drivers of growth like Dubai and Hong Kong and some of these others. My first question for you is, what is Catawba? And specifically, how is a digital economic zone like the one that you all are building different from other kinds of economic zones? Cool. Well, it's interesting that you said, uh, what is the Catawba? You didn't say, what is the Catawba digital economic zone? You asked, what is the Catawba? And that's a much broader question. Um, the Catawba have existed for thousands of years in, around this area, um, extending as far as Virginia, all the way down to Georgia. Obviously, like most Native American tribes, especially in the, in the East Coast, um, that's significantly lower. And as of now, they have about 3.3 thousand uh, spread across the United States, mostly within the area between Northern Charlotte or Southern uh, uh, North Carolina down to uh, mid uh, South Carolina. Um, and like a lot of Native American tribes, they actually experienced termination uh, in the 1940s, but like many Native Americans that suffered under the termination policy, they fought back. They fought like crazy and they sued the federal government and they won in the 1990s. Um, but because of that process, they had restrictions specifically on gaming that, um, that curtailed them. So they had to get creative about ways that they leverage sovereignty for economic development. And, you know, the bread and butter for, uh, Native American tribes across the United States has been gaming. Um, and that's actually been an advantage to them because of Native American tribes, because of they have lacked, you know, the structure and the capital and therefore expertise to run a full scale uh, business uh, uh, environment for as a government. They've been focusing on these one off examples of jurisdictional arbitrage, whether that's gaming or cannabis or uh, tobacco or what have you. Um, but because the Catawba are nimble and had to be creative They've been focusing on new ways to leverage it, more like a traditional government, the fullest extension of their sovereignty in providing governance services for companies that are domiciled within their zone. So they started working on the special economic zone project about six years ago. About three years into that, they brought me in because of my work at the Starp Society's foundation, now called Starp Society's Network, which is a nonprofit that uh, helps entrepreneurs and stakeholders build special economic zones around the world, has a how-to guide or how to build special economic zones. In fact, some of your listeners might want to use it. It sounds like a, you're in that process as we speak and uh, an academic journal in that space. So they brought me on uh, and I, I sort of brought a little bit of expertise when it comes to digital assets. Um, and we worked with the nation to develop a specific legislative package and engage directly with Catawba citizens. Uh, and they, you know, through this grassroots movement that they led, they secured a, a special meeting on February 19th of this year, and they passed that legislation into law. I really appreciate the background on the Catawba people. 
and have more questions about the the nature of the relationship between Kataba and then the 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 enterprise that you're directly working with, which I'll circle back to. But first, I, w- I want to kind of understand the the larger mission of the the digital economic zone. So you mentioned your work with Startup Societies Network, your digital expertise. Why is you, and you mentioned the the nimbleness of the Kataba. Why is why are digital assets and, and a digital economic zone the next sort of horizon or, or frontier for thinking about how they can play up jurisdictional advantages and what yeah sort of repeating the, the question from before how how is a digital economic zone different from other kinds of economic zones? Sure. So the the, the bread and butter of special economic zones around the world has always been real estate essentially under the land lease model, you develop a regulatory commercial or tax incentives or all the above, make it super attractive for businesses or residents to locate there. And then they lease space and um, the increased lease revenue then pays the special economic zone. That's always been the model. Um, But like everything uh, nowadays, especially in the wake of COVID, uh, digitization is happening and you do not necessarily have to be physically located in an area to have those benefits. And we've already seen this even before COVID, like uh, Estonia as an example, been benefiting from the laws and accessing a market through remotely domiciling company. But even something that's pretty mundane that happens literally every single day, which is Delaware. You know, they 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 register hundreds of thousands of companies, generates you know like 1.6 billion in in, in 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 revenue annually, and they're leaving a lot of money on the table by doing so. Um, uh, so this happens all the time. You don't necessarily have to be located in a place to experience jurisdictional arbitrage. And the reason why it's beneficial for tribes is that they have the same status as U.S. states. Um, so they're able to move nimbly. And because of they are a smaller tribe, they're able to move their institutions faster to meet with technological changes. And because of it's always important to be considerate of uh, the land question when, when working with Native American tribes, and they are for all the right reasons concerned about their land use, they want to, you, you know, leverage their jurisdictional arbitrage without having to sacrifice, you know, some of the land use considerations. So it kind of fit perfectly with all the requirements that they have. That's really interesting. I, I'm curious. Yeah. Like, so I, I have my own small LLC that I just do like freelancing work through. It's incorporated through Delaware. And I mostly did that because it's just sort of common knowledge and business practice that for some reason you should incorporate in Delaware because it's somehow simple or advantageous to you. And also that's what Stripe recommends. So I'm curious, how did Delaware build its advantage in this space? And then how do you, with the economic zone, think about disrupting Delaware effectively? To say it really bluntly, they're old. That's really what it comes down to. Where They're one of the first uh, jurisdictions in the United States that allow you to charter a company without having to go into a legislature. So that 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 was key. Being able to go through a, a simple procedure through the Secretary of State to register a company that was a real advantage a couple hundred years ago um, that didn't exist prior to that. And as a consequence of that, um, they've been able to develop case law because of uh, U.S. legal system and other common law legal systems are all based on precedent. So Delaware has stacked up this this case law over hundreds of years. And they've also made sure that their corporate codes, meaning the statutes which limit what businesses can and can't do as LLCs or as C-Corps or as trusts, what have you, they're all pretty nimble, you know, streamed down, nimble touch. So they've been able to maintain that. And also beyond just the case law and all that, momentum, brand recognition. They actually have brand ambassadors that go across the world, you know, explaining the benefits of Delaware. Um, and as a consequence of that, companies get about a 5% premium on the likelihood of getting funding versus other jurisdictions. Um, but the thing about the Catawba is that we meet all of those advantages and then excel in others. Uh, for instance, when it comes to case law, our, our corporate code and our commercial code is based off of template laws that are created by the Uniform Law Commission, the American Bar Association, and the American uh, Legal Institute. And a lot of those laws are taken from an aggregate of all common law jurisdictions around the world, synthesized into what they call black letter rulings to create a simple corporate code. So basically we have 
that that hundreds of years of precedent baked directly into it. And if they want to have you know arbitral decisions or court decisions that are informed by that case law that Delaware has, our users have the ability to have a choice of venue in their contracts where they can say, we want to go to an arbiter that uses Wyoming case law or Panama case law, well, not Panama because that's civil, but uh, or Delaware case law, or even go to the Chancery Court if they want. So we have all that met. And we also have uh, zero state corporate tax within the zone. But the ways that we succeed them is for one, that nimble regulatory body, not just on the legislative side through the tribe, you know, 3,000 plus people, but also the structure of the zone itself is run by the zone authority, which is a regulatory body similar to a secretary of state plus a financial services regulator. And that's governed by a council of five, commission of five. And they meet every two weeks and they move very quickly. In fact, we just became the first jurisdiction in the United States to adopt uh, amendments to the UCC to incorporate digital assets. Normally that takes 12 to 24 months. We did it under a month. Well, I, I saw that as news from yesterday. We're recording this on August 26th. And uh, I, was, I wanted to ask about it because for, first, just for listeners, the, the acronym UCC you gave the, is the, Unifer, the Uniform Commercial Code. I'm cur- in the press release that came out from the AP News called this the world's most advanced legal framework for digital assets. Two questions here. What makes it the world's most advanced legal framework for digital assets specifically? And then separately, how does one amend a uniform commercial code? Does an amendment in a specific jurisdiction no longer make it uniform? This is just me with no legal background looking for help. That's a really good question. It's actually kind of strange. Did you know that most of the most important laws in the United States are actually made by private nonprofits? They've been in so for hundreds of years. So the Uniform Commercial Code is created by a nonprofit called the Uniform Law Commission. They've existed since the 1890s, I believe. Um, And what they do is that they propose these uniform codes that are adopted by all 50 states. I think one of the only variations is that uh, Louisiana deviate slightly because they inherited a lot of, you know, French civil code, civil law. Um, But across all the states, they have nine articles, which, you know, deal with things like uh, secure transactions, securities, banking that are consistent. Um, But there is updates, like always, like with any good organization. So the Uniform Law Commission, they create these new template laws or amendments on occasion. And in 2019, they commissioned the study uh, and to work on amendments specifically to deal with digital assets. And basically the way I like to describe it is that the Uniform Law Commission is basically a bunch of legal monks, monks that essentially they, they focus so heavily on the law that to lay people, it seems so arcane. It's almost like debating the, uh, like how many angels are in the pin of a needle. But like, instead, it's how many secu- how many how can you perfect a, a security transaction on the head of a needle? But it's actually really important, and the level of care that get, they go into it is incredible. Um, and it's really important that whatever reforms uh, through the digital asset framework are incorporated into it, because otherwise, it wouldn't be interoperable with the rest of the legal system. And that's why it's so competitive. Because in order to have a real legal framework, you need to have a holistic one that works with the whole economy and plugs into different pieces. There's been some like ad hoc type of reforms in different jurisdictions like Gibraltar. It was big for a while, but they specifically made something about ICOs, but nothing about the rest of the digital asset system. And you see that here and there versus what places like Wyoming and Liechtenstein have done is that they incorporated digital assets under the entire legal and property framework. But even the way that Wyoming did it was a little bit problematic. And it's precisely because they could not touch the Uniform Commercial Code. Basically, only the Uniform Law Commission can do that. As a consequence, the way that they went about it is kind of like they took duct tape and glue and started working with property definitions rather than dealing directly with Uniform Commercial Code. But because of the, uh, the ULC was able to draft that, they were able to make amendments directly to the UCC, making it simpler cleaner, technologically neutral. And because of those legal minds, the most forward thinking digital asset uh, framework in the United States. And I would argue because it is more holistic and it is based on, you know, hundred years of precedent, the most advanced in the world. I would love to add some examples to this 
like precedent setting where if so cabin itself is a DAO, but we also are an unincorporated nonprofit in Texas really? for the sake of working quickly in our earlier days as, as there's a lot of legal questions we don't know the answers to. And we wanted to just be able to do some basic things like own trucks and stuff like that. Um, so I'm, I'm curious, how do ERC 20s get treated under like a CD easy framework or how are digital assets, are, are they regarded as securities? What what are advantages to your, this new framework that DAOs like Cabin or Kraushaus or even maybe potentially network states could benefit from? What's what's the pitch to, to DAOs to come and set up relationships with the CDEZ? Well, so there's a question about the digital assets, but it's really interesting that you said you've been that you have an, it's an unincorporated nonprofit association? Correct. Have you seen our draft regulations for, for DAOs? Uh, uh, no. Actually. That's okay. That's what makes that, it super cool. Great, great, um, great next question. T- tell us about draft regulations for DAOs. So we actually provide a menu format. So Wyoming, they have the LLC model where you can incorporate as an LLC. But we add an additional framework where you can register as an unincorporated nonprofit association. Um, and essentially just, as you know, it's the most flexible entity type out there. And a lot of people that are in the DAO space have been, you know, saying that it's beneficial for quite some time. Instead of having to refer to the statute constantly, it is governed through the governing principles. So it's able to move a lot more nimbly and flexibly. Also, it doesn't have to have a registered agent, yet at the same time, it can have a bank account. And I don't know about Texas, but as far as I can tell, most UNAs in the United States, uh, they don't have limited liability. They're treated almost like partnerships. But within our zone, you actually have limited liability while maintaining this level of flexibility. So it's interesting that you said that. I, I appreciate that. And uh, I'm also here wishing that that John Hillis, who is uh, one of the founders of the DAO and, and helped to spearhead this front, was here so that I could kind of ask him questions and, and have you both t- talk at the same time. But for another day, I suppose... What about my, my earlier question regarding yeah. like an ERC-20 or just NFTs? Like, I, I think that there's a lot of crypto entrepreneurs or even just retail investors who aren't sure how to think about crypto assets because they're so new and because like the SEC and other like U.S. bodies do move slowly and in, in coming to decisions here. Say yeah. like Cabin, for example, we try not to talk about token price because really like we care about building our network city and the token price moves and like doesn't affect our real goals right now. Like it's, we think it's distracting to focus on price, but like still if I'm like a member of cabin Dow and I have some cat, some cabin and it grows in price over the course of the year and and I sell a little bit, like, is it a security? Like how, how should crypto entrepreneurs think about some of these tokens in uh, and how they're regulated as digital assets. So first, one thing to mention, um, we do have the same status as the U.S. states. So ultimately, federal securities law is applicable to where there is interstate commerce with securities. So that that's clear. But we do have the same authority uh, at the at the state level, and there are uh, realms of autonomy for states to develop blue sky regulations and commercial codes in regards to securities. And blue sky regulations, especially for when transactions happen within uh, uh, a jurisdiction. So the, specifically how the UCC deals with it. Um, so what they call is they have this just general category. And this is why it's technologically neutral, because we have no idea what new technologies are going to pop up within the next five years or so. They call them controllable electronic records. And that ties to like old uh, amendments to the UCC, where basically they say that electronic signatures and other forms of electronic communications count under commercial code. So a controllable electronic record is where it's not just a document, like a signature or a contract. It actually has the value itself. So that could be a thing like an NFT. That can be something like an ERC-20. That could be something like Bitcoin. And the way that's defined is how it's used. And the way that they define it is how it's traditionally defined, because the UCC does have its own definition of of security underneath it. Um, as of right now, the zone does not have any additional uh, uh, securities framework. So the only relevant securities framework is federal law. We will be developing our own securities framework 
especially for interactions that happen solely within the zone. Um, but ultimately, we're at the same status of every single state and make sure you're compliant with that. But the UCC does provide clarity in a bunch of different things. So I want to transition for a second back to the relationship that the Digital Economic Zone has with the Catawba tribe. On your website, you write that the CDEZ is a sovereign regulatory zone established and backed by the Catawba Indian Nation. You have specifically used the pronoun they to refer to Catawba, so not we. So I'm, I'm assuming that you're not personally a, a member of the Catawba Indian Nation, but I'm curious, assuming that's true, like how did the relationship begin? You mentioned that they sort of reached out to you given your expertise, but like what, what is your lesson what what uh, how has your appreciation for the Catawba people grown and uh, like what as you've worked with them and yeah what is the formal working relationship between the Catawba Indian, Indian Nation and the CDEZ yeah I I don't have the honor uh, nor the pleasure of being a Catawba citizen um, but I do have the pleasure of being uh, there they are my boss and I'm happy for that and uh uh, the reason that developed is because, um, as I stated earlier, I was, I've been working on startup societies and, uh, one of the people that have been working on the team three years prior to, uh, contacting me, he contacted, uh, one of our advisors, uh, Tom W. Bell, um, based on his book, um, your next government, your, your listeners should definitely catch that book. It's good. Um, we may have to. P Professor Bell on the show soon, if we're lucky. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Let me know if you need help there. And uh, yeah, he talked specifically about SEZ. So they contacted him and then Tom's like, well, you know, I'm a little busy at the moment, but um, you know, you take a look at this show and tell me what you think. And like most people in the United States, I thought this is kind of silly. You know, Native Americans are, are paper tigers. They're not truly sovereign. Um, found out I was completely and totally wrong. It's the exact opposite, that they have that authority. They just haven't had the structure in place to make it happen. Um, so um, worked with them and, and uh, their team, and then we developed an MOU with uh, their business arm, Catawba Corporations. Uh, and based off of that, um, we moved down to South Carolina where the real work began, which it wasn't just the, the developing of the legal framework with the attorneys. So we definitely developed a, a working relationship there. But the real work was working with Catawba leaders, you know, heads of families, elders, sitting down and breaking bread um, and developing personal relationships with them. And I've been, yeah, I've been incredibly honored by the trust and, and them inviting me into their homes and into their lives and frankly, some very personal situations with them. Um, and you know, because of the relationships that we built, we, I can think I can say this definitively. I think we created the first grassroots movement for special economic zones where, where, where our Catawba citizens were going out there and, and, and pushing with their, their uh, elected leaders to make sure that this happens. And they even secured a special session of their legislators specifically to talk about and to vote on this zone. So that's, you know, leading up to that, you know, going to Golden Corral, you know, multiple times a week with printed materials, eating fried chicken at 8 a.m. Um, <laughs> and uh, and fried chicken at 3 p.m. Uh, <laughs> later on. And, uh, you know, like going door to door, printing signs, um, just all sort of things, you know, associated with community engagement. And uh, it got voted in a landslide on February 19th. Yeah, as, as part of that grassroots movement, which I love that approach, what were the biggest concerns that folks had as you went through that process? Well, I mean, like with anything with crypto, you know, like, is this like some dark web stuff, you know, like not really understanding it. But actually, I got less of those concerns than from just off the street Americans. Um, I would say that they understand the legal framework approach infinitely more than most people in the United States. And I think part of that is because of their close proximity to their government, that they are, you know, legislators in their everyday lives. So they understood it very quickly. It didn't take much. I uh, was just basically just creating pamphlets of material, which explained the project and 
just if they have any questions regarding that um, to answer. I mean, their main concern, it wasn't even a concern, but it was a question that needs to be asked is what is the structure? And I think that was one of your questions too. So what the law did is that it created that commercial code that I talked about, but importantly, it created two different organizations. Uh, arguably the most important organization in a sense is the zone authority, which in a, in a legal sense, it's actually just a part of the Catawba government. And it is run by an independent commission with its own assets and liabilities, but it is run by a, a five-person commission of Catawba citizens chosen by elected leadership uh, and business leaders, et cetera. Um, and that body is responsible not just for creating regulations for the zone uh, or, or registering companies, but also making sure that the zone is completely under Catawba control. And then the other entity within the zone is the for-profit management company. And that entity is majority owned by Catawba citizens. It is a corporation and the rest owned by private partners. And in not just that stock ownership, that is 100% non-dilutable, but also uh, a board distribution that cannot be changed. That is five uh, Catawba citizens versus four private partners. So no matter how you cut it, the Catawba are always in control of this project. It is their project. They govern it. They push, push the rules. They legislate. They control the business board. It's theirs. Um, we just provide expertise when necessary. Awesome. I really appreciate that. That was candidly like my biggest concern sort of yeah. coming into this episode. And I appreciate the, the transparency you just provided, but also the, the thoughtfulness of how the project is is constructed. In, in the other ways, it's like that the money is, di is distributed pro rata, you know, based on their ownership percentage. And also in addition to the uh, the monetary advantage, we also make, sh uh, make sure that we're planning to make an apprenticeship program where Catawba citizens will uh, be hired by companies that are registered within the zone. In fact, uh, e-residents will get benefits for hiring Catawba citizens and be actually be able to defer on fees with their LLC and what have you. So this isn't just about money, though it certainly is. It's also about creating jobs for the long term. Awesome. Is there a target industry or category of company that you're being intentional in pursuing, like maybe it is a, a digital first company, or are you open to a wide variety of industries? How do you think about growing that base of companies? That so our ultimate goal is to disrupt Delaware. So that means being a general jurisdiction for all industries. But ultimately, you can't boil the whole ocean. You know, Facebook, when they got started, they didn't start as a general social media site. They focused on a couple Ivy League universities. Then they did universities in general. Then they started opening up to the public. So you need to have an initial target market and especially one that you have a competitive advantage in. So that's why we're focusing on Web3. There's a lot of lack of definition of digital assets uh, with the United States legal system, but there's a tremendous upside for those that are able to provide that environment. Um, and because we're nimble, we can serve that better. So we're, we're targeting there first, but our ultimate goal is wider, but yeah. Target companies, exchanges, DAOs, fintechs, uh, uh, Novo banks, um, you know, people that work in NFTs or, or, or developing with digital assets. Those are the things that we think we can provide the most benefits to the quickest. Great. Yeah. And, and on this, the note of just, again, providing these like consistent frameworks, one of the topics that all the way up to Congress has been discussed without much certainty is is rules concerning stable coins. And another thing that you may announce between now and this episode being released is a, a proposal for, for rule making of stable coins. What are the general principles there and how you think about governing stable coins? So first and foremost, uh, our stable coin regulation will be related to our banking code, which we have a draft regulation for. And that's based off of a uh, banking code set in South Dakota, North Dakota, and Wyoming. Um, we think that what Wyoming did was really great, but what they didn't allow for is traditional banking enterprise in addition to digital assets. Basically, their, their speedy bank special depository institutions are trusts. They can hold digital assets, but they can't really do traditional banking business like lending based on deposits. This framework allows for that while making sure that you're compliant and stable and what have you. Um, we'll... And I'm not going to really talk about it right now, but it will provide for a way to make it easier to access traditional U.S. payment rails like Fedwire, et cetera. Um, and what we'll do within that framework is define 
what type of entity types can do stable coin regulations, what types of assets they will do, and sort of define, you know, what, you know, how algorithmic stable coins relate to asset backed or deposit backed or what have you. And the main goal of this advanced rulemaking notice is to get questions and feedback from the community about what they want to integrate that into our draft stable coin regulation. And then we'll present that to the public before it is approved. Great. The w- one thing, I have, I have sort of two last questions to take us out. One thing I'm curious about, especially just marinating on on how you are going to think about Web3 companies first is, is just the, the corporate structure of, of CDEZ and, and how how you're thinking about growing the team. So you're the CEO. What are the core functions of a digital economic zone, especially one with the aspirations to disrupt the billion dollar governance as a service industry that, that Delaware is? How are you thinking about growing your team? Interesting. Well, maybe I got to read some books. <laughs> well, the, well, the way that we want to do this, we want to provide it as nimbly as possible. And we want to make sure that the bulk of the governing or all the governing is done on the Catabo side that the rulemaking is done on their side and they have their own internal team for that, um, that they are the one registering the companies. What we're providing is focusing on the for-profit services that need to you know, get done there, uh, the, the software element of it, what's happening to the real estate, into the infrastructure, marketing to it. So we want to make sure that we're pretty nimble, focusing on just the things that the government needs in order to support itself. Gotcha. And so then to take us out, got a sense of like what the one to three year vision might be and focusing on, on these web three industries and, and writing a lot of these frameworks and, and growing just the foundation of, of what the digital economic zone will be. But what is both the, the five year vision and then also maybe like the 50 year vision, if you're, you're wildly successful, how will the CDs be a player on the world stage? So in five years, I think that we should at least be, on close playing field with Delaware, if not surpassing it. So that's, that's our goal there. In 50 years, I want the zone to be a catalyst to change American federalism. I want it to be, well, go ahead. I was just, I was going to say, what do you, what do you mean by that? Right now, federalism in the United States has focus on states versus federal. Um, and sort of the dynamic of that has changed over the, the years. Um, but the constitution doesn't talk just about states and the federal government. Built within the constitution are the ideas of pre-constitutional sovereigns, Native American tribes. And we're now in a time where we're seeing increasing distrust of centralization, not just from crypto circles, but from people that are just looking at politics and seeing our reaction and our capability on the federal level. So they're sort of devolving down to the more local state level. Um, And I think that the leaders in that are going to be the tribes. And I think that the Catawba are in a position where they can fundamentally change our orientation about federalism and governance in the United States. And frankly, I think that the Catawba can be something that saves and reinvigorates the United States. I think it could become one of the biggest hubs in the United States, maybe even a physical hub one day um, with something that we can explore at a certain point. Um, But yeah, I think it could be absolutely transformative. Awesome. Well, Joseph, thanks so much for joining the show. Where should listeners go if they want to learn more about the Catawba Digital Economic Zone? Sure. So go to katabadigital.zone. Great. We'll have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much.